alive, you are alive. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to the most special kind of a live safari start. We're here with the great Queen of Juma, Her Highness Karula, the 11 year old or 12 year old female leopard. That's her there obviously. And the two cubs, now four months old, are here as well. You can't see them, I'm afraid. I've just got sight of one with a pair of binoculars on a termite mound across the way there. The female is, we think that's the male, the female just the other side here. She did start calling them recently. She sort of stood up and she did that chuffing noise. That might attract them back here fairly soon. Anyway, you are on a live safari, the best kind of live safari with leopard and cubs. My name is James Hendry. On camera today, Brian, the penguin thumb Joubert today. Very nice, Brian. Very nice. And in the final control, we have got Kirsten McLennan-Smith being ably assisted by Geraldine Cheesecake Kent and Chelsea the Greenback Green. And in the other vehicle, Jamie Patterson being filmed by William Durham Brack. But for the moment, let us enjoy Kurula. Now, if you're wondering what on earth this is, this is not a documentary. Oh, no. This is a live safari. We're broadcasting to you live from the iconic Kruger National Park, the western fringes thereof, a small private reserve called the Juma. And this is our queen here eating an impala, that has unfortunately had a very bad day, much better day for the rest of us who've been watching her. Please send us your questions, hashtag Safari Live if you're on Twitter, or questions at wildearth.tv if you'd like to talk to us on the email. We are going to sit here for as long as we can. We won't be able to be here all afternoon, everyone, so we might be here with the cubs, we might not. It just depends. Uh, we will have to move out once other vehicles start to get mobile, and by mobile I mean, you know, we're surrounded by safari lodges, and their guests will want to come in here and see those cubs, and we, don't, we want to limit the amount of impact we have here, so we will have to move out at some stage. But for the moment, we will enjoy ourselves with Karula and with Uh, not official names by any stretch of the imagination at this stage. It's a balmy 23 degrees Celsius, which I think is 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And here we are, what a joy. We're going to be joined in about half an hour. She's chuffing. She's going chaw, chaw, chaw to her. I tell you, these cubs are nervous. Cubs this before. But he's not making any move to come towards her. I think I can hear them. I can. I can hear her. Let's see what happens here. I'm just scanning, scanning with my binoculars to see if I can see the other little one. She's still chuffing. She's calling them again. The male is not moving for love nor money. So we're not going to start the engine. I know we don't have the best view at the moment. I don't obviously want to get between her and the cubs. Not because it'll make her cross, but because it will freak the cubs out. So we're going to sit here very patiently. And with any luck, they'll come out and play with her with each other. There she's calling the female. The female's just behind the bush where she's walking now. You can see that bit of light green in the background of your picture. That's where the female is. Or one of the cubs. I think it's Brent said he thought it was the female. The male is sat still, looking a little bit worried that his mum's moving off. She won't move off completely. She's going towards where the female is. Once she settles, everyone, I will move. I just don't want to move just yet. To try and let her, let the little ones get used to us first. I can still see her. Yeah, you can still see her too.
keep an eye out. Um, here comes the male. The male's moving. Uh, Brian, he's come straight down the termite mound. You know where he is. You won't have visual of him yet. Can you see him yet? Well done. Well done. <laughs> there he is, everyone. George has come to see his mum. I'm going to wait for him to get to her before I move. And we're not going to go close, but we'll, we can. There's a nice clearing in front of us, and we can go forward towards that, and we can just turn off there. So he's now with his sister. While he's behind that bush, I'm just going to start the car. So there she comes. She's coming too now. There she is. <laughs> this is fantastic. Let's hope we can get a view through here, everyone. I just don't want to make a noise. I'm going to drive very, 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 very slowly. So that we don't crackle and make noise with the vehicle. I think we're going to have a nice view, everyone, through here. Oh, this is going to be wonderful. If they come out, say when, Brian. Okay, we're now sitting about 30 meters from her, maybe 40 meters, and that's about 120 feet, which should be fine. Like I say, I find it very strange that they're so nervous of cars. Just behind where her tail is flicking. There, there, there. You see Brian walking to the right hand side, moving away from her again. She's moving again. Sorry, Debbie in Vancouver, you sent through a question that I'm afraid I failed to hear. We'll just get it through again. Oh, I see is you want to know if their size difference is normal. Charlotte looks a little bit smaller than George. It's completely normal, yes. I don't think either of them are particularly large or particularly small. I'm in two minds as to what to do now. I think she is probably going to... Can you see it, Brian? No. Yeah, there we go. We've got movement now. There we go. Sweet little leopard cub. I don't know which one that is. So cute. <laughs> there goes the other one. Same same path. Okay, they've now cro both crossed the road the road. And they're going to where she is. I don't know where she's going. I can see them both moving. What we'll do, let's go back onto the road where we can drive with a real sort of smoothness rather than crackling along here. This is wonderful. Well, they're playing there on the tree. Sorry, everybody, let's move quickly before they get away from us. We are quite a distance from them. Right. I don't want to make too much noise still. The carcass we're going to leave, obviously. And if we had all the time in the world, of course, we'd just sit here and wait by the carcass. We're not going to do that for now. Right, so we're now on the road, so we can drive very carefully. And apart from the fact that the elephants have put a very large tree here. and the lowest gear we can so that there's no revving and noise. They were walking just through to the left-hand side there. You see anything, Brian? There, look, look, right in the tree, right in the tree here. <laughs> They're both there. In fact, I think Mum's in there as well. I can't believe it. Look. 
And Dorse, you're in Pittsburgh. You might be still trying a little bit to get the odd bit of uh, milk, but they're pretty much weaned. Brian, you're okay there? 100%. How awesome is that, everyone? I can't believe this. They see how they seem to feel so much more secure once they're in the tree. I wonder if we shouldn't try and move around the other side. Yeah, all three are in the tree. Let's try and move around the other side, everyone. Just judge how they react according to the, the up. They look pretty pretty chilled out with the mum in the tree. This is so, so, so special. Oh my goodness, Brian, look at that. This is too special for words. So that's mum's tail that you can see there. I think we'll just sit right here. That's the, about the best view. Now let's see which one that is. I think that's the female. And I think it's the female because she, does, she hasn't got blue eyes. Was it the male that had blue eyes? The female that had blue eyes? The female's got the brown eyes. Yes, that's right. So that's her. It's Talot. Now we can see her spot pattern. She's a 2-2 female, everyone. Oh, she's too wonderful. <laughs> oh, wow. So lucky. We'll just sit here for a little while, see what they do. All three of them climbed up in this tree. I, mean, I can't believe it. And we might go a little bit further around the tree at some stage to see if we can get a view of Mum and the other one. <laughs> just, I can't believe there's three leopards in one tiny scraggly little maroon tree. <laughs> And you know, we drive around here a lot and we spend a lot of time trying to find these animals and we spend a lot of time waiting for them and we spend a lot of time being deeply frustrated by them but it becomes so utterly absorbing and worth it when you have an unspeakably wonderful sighting like this. You see how cleverly hidden they are. Here comes the male. what he's doing there. Now that's the brown eyes. Those are the brown eyes, aren't they? Yeah. Brian? That must be Mrs. And Deborah in Oklahoma, you say see, seeing leopards is the great way to start your day. Well, Deborah, I think for anybody who doesn't think that this is a good way to start the day, well, they just need their heads red, don't they? It's the best possible way to start your day and my afternoon. That's the female. Yeah, that's Mrs. You can very clearly see her back end there. Not very cleverly climbing at the moment. There she comes. He's not quite as comfy as the other two. Hmm. Look at those eyes watching us. <laughs> That's so cool. Everybody, let's just savour this. Yes, it's not an everyday occurrence, of course.
Hmm. I'm tempted to move slightly forward, but I don't think I'm going to. Just because she's moving around quite a lot, she's not comfortable. Her back end is completely uncomfortable. Her brother, however, is fast asleep, as is her mother. A brilliant mother. Eight cubs risen, raised to independence as of now. These two have got over the most dangerous part. They're absolutely by no stretch of the imagination through everything. But they've got through the most dangerous part of their lives. And I think they're going to be just fine. Hello, Julia in Houston. You say that the little female has got a butterfly pattern on her forehead, and that might be, you want to know what the Shangan name for that is. Shangan name for a butterfly is um, <laughs> paparati. <laughs> I've always found it in a very funny name, say so paparati is a butterfly or a moth in Shangan. I don't think paparazzi would be a good name for her, Julia. I think she's prettier than that. Let's try and roll back. I might get a better view of her. I didn't want him to react to us, but he has. I just want to see if we can see her. You're still right there, Ryan. Yep. It might just give us... Oh, there's a nice shot. There you are. How's that? Can you get it? Vanessa, you said what age will they be out of danger? Um, it, yeah, it, you said about a year. Yes, a, a year would certainly be a good time. They'll be more out of danger. But until they've established their own territories, you know, I mean, a leopard is never out of danger, not even Karula's out of danger. But and once they've established their own territories, then they're kind of at their safest, if you like. But until then, especially the males, they will be, they won't be in particularly safe. But yes, every day they get, every day they survive and become slightly more experienced. so they become safer. This is beyond speech. Three leopards in a tree. We have them all to ourselves. Now, we have a very special classroom of people called from Trantwood Elementary School in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and it's really very, very special to have you with us, kids. Sitting in that tree over there is what, probably the most special predator in the whole of Africa. And our predator is an animal, well, it eats other animals, just like your cats and dogs at home. But this is the wild African leopard. And we are so lucky, we've got two babies there. On the right-hand side is a male, and on the left, a female. And they're sleeping in the tree, everyone, because they're safe up there and they're completely safe and you can see in the middle between the two of them is their mum you can just see her tail hanging down there now please do ask us any questions you might want to about leopards or about africa or about anything that we're seeing here it's lovely to have you with us my name's james and filming with great skill behind me is brian Brian, I'm going to do one more sneak forward because I can see Mrs.'s nose and you can't. And I think it'll be quite nice. <laughs> so relaxed. You see the mum? 
Hello, Riley. You want to know how long I've been going on safari and if I ever take people with me. Well, Riley, I do sometimes take people with me, but I used to do that a lot more. Now, I do much more of this sort of thing, where I speak to people all over the world through the camera, which is a nice way of entertaining people. I'm just quickly going to talk on the radio, or I'm going to ask Kirsty, who's directing, to just get Jamie, who's the other ranger, to tell everyone that the leopard is still on site in the same place. Or well, in the meantime, in fact, let's head across to Jamie and then I'll tell everybody that the leopards are here. Good afternoon and welcome to all of you at Chantwood Elementary. And welcome to our portion of your safari. So my name is Jamie and this afternoon I have a gentleman called Viam on camera with me. And I hear that you've been having an amazing experience having a look at those incredible little leopard cubs. We have a little thing of our own, but in this case it is a tiny antelope. And a, oh, and there he goes. Realized that we were looking at it. And that little antelope was called a steenbok. They like to hide away in the dense vegetation and in the bushes around these sorts of areas. Now you've just caught me as I'm about to go past and around one of our water holes. But as you can see, as we go through, the water hole is completely dry. Now it is our winter time, which is generally our dry season, which means we don't get any rain at this time of year. But unfortunately, in South Africa, we're currently in the middle of a really bad drought, which means that even in our summertime, which is meant to be our rainy season, we didn't get very much rain at all. So there's only really a few places that the animals can go to get water. And as we go along, we're going to have to drive at an angle as we go through. The dam is completely devoid of, there's no water here at all. But luckily for the animals, there are places where the lodges are actually bringing water up out of the ground and using those to provide them with a little bit of water. Here we go. Up and out of the dip. I'm trying to find the lions that Brent had this morning. And but you were wondering about the average temperature in Africa. And it depends obviously on our, our winter and our summer. So our summers get really, really hot here. We're in a place called the Low Felt, which means it's sheltered by the mountains. And we get hot weather around well over, this summer in particular has been well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit pretty much every single day. Our winters, in the, in the sort of the morning time, first thing in the morning when it's at its coldest, it can go right down to around 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And then in the summer, I mean in the winter, in the afternoon, you can see that I'm in a t-shirt at the moment, I'm in a shirt, because it doesn't get too cold. It sits around the mid 70 Fahrenheit. But the summer temperatures go much, much higher. And the summer temperature average is somewhere around 90 in Fahrenheit. The winter average is around probably 60 to 70 Fahrenheit. I don't want to keep you away from the leopard for too long, so back to James and the wonderful cubs. We have not moved anywhere at all, and nor have the leopards, everyone. They're all just lying there. And they're so full, they're not moving because they have been eating a whole lot of impala. Now remember I said that they were predators and they eat other animals. Well, the most common animal that we get out here is something called a impala. And an impala is an antelope, which for you guys in the United States is a bit like your deer. And the mother leopard killed it an impala yesterday or probably early this morning 
and then she brought the youngsters across and they've all been enjoying the meat for the whole day and now they're so full that they're fast asleep in the tree and Anna you very clever question you want to know if these leopards have this different patterns in the same way that zebra have different patterns Anna they absolutely do no leopard has the same spots and you can already see so one of the ways that we under identify the leopards is by their unique spots so one of our viewers was just saying that the one that the not that one the other one uh, has got a butterfly pattern on the front of her forehead and uh, you won't be able to see that from here but so that's a good way of identifying her and that won't change throughout her life you know the old saying that goes a leopard doesn't change its spots well in this case that's absolutely true those spots won't change they'll just get a little bit bigger and a little bit further apart and then the other one that Brian was showing you has got two different spots on either side of its nose two on the left and two on the right which we of course we can't see at the moment because his head is the other side but that's how we will uh, identify him and only he will have those spots in that particular position so yes they're very very different spots can be difficult to tell though because if you're not used to looking at them they all kind of look the same hmm. and Jasmine a very good question of course one of the big things about being a little animal is that you have to say very safe and you want to know if they can run as fast as their mum yet well they're quite fast and they're quite good at climbing but they're only four months old you know and in the same way I mean you could consider a four month old leopard I guess the same as you guys about eight years old in human years so you know that you're not quite as fast as your mum and your dad yet but when you're about 12 or 13 well then you'll be nearly as fast as your mum and maybe when you're about 15 you'll be as fast as your dad and that's the same with the leopards so when they get to the human equivalent of say 15 which is about a year old well then they will be as fast as their mum so they're still fast but they're not quite as fast as their mum but they're very good at climbing and that's how they stay away from other predators now we know that they are vulnerable to other predators like lions and hyenas and so they have to stay out of the way and they do that by climbing now Riley of course it's very difficult for you to tell looking at the screen how big they are Riley these cubs are well let's try and describe it they're probably about a foot and a half long from the tip of the nose to the base of the tail so that's where the tail comes to the sort of top of the body and if she extends the tail out behind her there probably about mm, two and a half feet so one and a half feet long from the bottom to the top and they weigh very little at this stage probably only about five kilograms 11 pounds or so the females a bit bigger she's 12 years old now and she's like can you imagine an Alsatian dog she's like a really big Alsatian dog that's about the same size as she is she probably weighs about 45 kilograms which in pounds is about a hundred pounds so that's how big they are the cubs are about the size of let me try and think of a dog size they're they're about the size of say what Brian a, a staffy maybe about that yeah. about the size of a Staffordshire Bull Terrier I don't know if you know what that is everyone but that's about the size that they are so they're much bigger than a house cat by this stage Oh, Grace, you very ask a very good question, and it's a question you know that we get asked a lot about lots of the baby animals that we see out here. Where is their father? Well, we're pretty sure that their father's name is Tingana, and Tingana is the big male leopard that lives in this area, but the male leopards don't have any role in playing parent, so they don't look after these little ones well they don't look after them directly so inside Tingana's territory he's got three or four females and two of them have got babies and so he looks after both families but he doesn't look after them by being around them 
he looks after them by staying close by and making sure that other male leopards don't come around and harm his babies. So that's how a uh, leopard male is a good father. Stations one, one station here, all animals up in a marilla tree. I was just talking on the radio there, everyone. Go ahead. Copy that. All right, let's head across to Jamie and find out what she's looking for. I know she's looking for some other cats. Maybe she'll be lucky. We are indeed looking for some other cats, and we have been lucky enough to find one. Now, at the moment, we're right on the boundary of the places that we can go. So certain lodges can go to certain places and certain vehicles can go to certain places, but the same rule does not apply to the animals. They can go absolutely anywhere that they want. They've got four million football fields of wild area to wander about without any fences except around the edges. Now that's why we're sitting very far away. However, in the distance, if we look closely, you'll be able to spot a big cat. Just have a look at that. A lioness lying up not too far away from apparently where she has some food as well. So just like Karula and her cubs, this lioness has a kill hidden in the bushes. And apparently she also has cubs with her as well. Unfortunately, because we can't get closer, I don't think we're going to be able to see the cubs. And if you're wondering why your picture's going all wavy, it's just because of the heat haze coming from the bonnet, from the front of the car. Now, Michael, we actually knew that this lioness was here, so I was on my way to see if maybe she hadn't come a little bit closer. But you were wondering, how do we find animals? Sometimes we just get lucky. Sometimes we drive along and the animal's just there. And a lot of the time what we do we look for their footprints in the sand. Animals like lions, like this lioness here, and like the leopard, they like to walk on the roads because it's easy and it's quiet. There's no trees in the way. What they do is they leave their footprints nicely in the soil for us to follow, and then we do what's known as tracking. So we get off the vehicle and we go for a walk, and we, sometimes we see their footprints, and then sometimes it's a sort of a, a guessing game as to where they might be. Uh, this lioness, I actually knew she was here but sometimes we just have to find them all on our own. She's very, very full, and she's doing what lions do best, which is lying down and sleeping. And a lion can sleep for up to 20, 22 hours in one day, especially if they have food with them. And Connor, you are looking at the biggest predator here, the lion. So the lion is the biggest predator, they also hunt in groups, which makes them even more effective. So the lionesses live together in prides, and the males sometimes are on their own, but quite often they're also in a group of males together. And that is a, oh, look how tired she is. And the reason she's so sleepy is because she's got such a full belly. Oh, look, there's a cub. There's a cub there. Yay! Oh, how wonderful. She's also got a baby with her. This is fantastic. Oh, this is such good news. I was really hoping that we would get to see the cubs, and we have. So she's got, I could only see one but apparently she does have more. And this is the first time that we've ever actually seen these lionesses' cubs before. This is the very, very first time. We knew that we had them, we knew that the lionesses had them, but they haven't come across close enough for us to see them until now. And they're just a few weeks old, but just old enough to be with the rest of the pride. And these, these lionesses are called the Styx females. And she's got a little cub suckling. 
So it's feeding from her. You can see its little ear twitching. Oh, what a wonderful day this has been. And she's also been eating. I can see that she's got a little bit of blood around her face as well. So she's been eating the buffalo that they have there. And this little cub is a long way to go before it is a brave hunter like its mom. Madison, you were wondering if or when how old a lion cub has to be before they leave their mothers. If it's a girl, Madison, it will never leave its mom. It will stay in the same pride for most of its life, unless something strange happens. So maybe a male comes in and the pride gets split up. But for the most part, females will stay with their mothers and their sisters and their aunts for their whole lives. If it's a boy, he will leave the safety of his pride at around three, three and a half years old. So it's quite a scary time for a young male lion. And we don't know yet if this is a boy or a girl. But if it's a boy, he's going to have to, hopefully, with his brothers. But he will have to leave at around that age. I'm so excited to be seeing him for the first time. Now, Aiden, I know that they're hidden really far away, but you were wondering why are the baby cubs hiding? And the answer is the lion cubs are not really hiding too much because they feel safe with their mother. It just so happens that Unfortunately, we can't go any closer. Now, they're not hiding, it's just that we're very far away. They feel perfectly safe. But when they were younger, Aiden, then they did hide because there's lots of things. A little lion cub is defenseless. They don't have, they can't fight back and anything out here. Their mom can't stay with them the whole time to protect them. So they have to be careful of things like leopards and hyenas, anything that could find them and pose a risk. So they have to hide away. And the same goes for the leopard cubs. They have to hide while their mom goes out hunting. And speaking of leopard cubs, let's go back to James and Karula. Look who turned round, everybody. There's mum. That's the queen of Juma. And we call her the queen because she spends most of her time here. And she is just our favorite, favorite leopard. She's 12 years old which I know sounds quite young to you, but for leopards, that's quite old. It's sort of like a, I guess, a 40-year-old human being. And she's just perfect, isn't she lovely? She's the clever mother who killed the impala for her babies. Oh, and Jesse, now, of course, you have been watching very, very lucky that we can see lion cub and leopard cub in one sighting and you want to know which one is the fastest well I think you'll probably find that a leopard is faster over a short distance and a lion is probably a bit faster over a long distance but they're pretty much the same you know they're so fast the fastest cat of course is often found around where you saw that lioness and that's called a cheetah and the cheetah runs at 60 miles an hour, whereas a leopard probably can maybe run at about 45 miles an hour. Colleen, very clever question. You obviously have been learning a lot about animals, and you say, do all mothers have their cubs at this time of the year? And the answer for the predators is no. So it's what we call a coincidence that the lioness and the leopard have their cubs at the same time. They can have babies any time of the year. So they're not like deer or moose or the impala that we see here, any of the antelope species which are like your deer. They're not the same as those which will have give birth at a very specific time every year, the same time every year. These, if these two cubs survive to adulthood, she will only give birth once every two and a half years or so, and it can be at any time of the year. And she's such a good hunter, you see, that it doesn't make any difference.
health question uh, sometimes I back over to get the best perfectly fast asleep just every now and again rolling over first of all because she's making herself comfortable it's kind of like if you have a very large Sunday lunch or a Sunday dinner and you've just eaten so much that you just kind of want to lie down and relax that's how she's feeling right now and also while she's lying down on the ground with the cub and while she's digesting all of that meat it makes a lot of heat inside her so it makes her really really hot and when she lies down on the ground it keeps getting warm and she has to roll over so it's kind of like when you're sleeping in bed at night and you wake up and you turn your pillow over and you put your head on the cold side and you guys are going into summer it's going to start getting warm there you know when you turn your pillow over that's kind of what the lioness is doing when she rolls over just herself more comfortable and she doesn't bother too much just rolls over and the, the cub either has to hang on and roll outside. At the moment, he's having he or she is having a good meal. I'm just going to just to, just to leave the. We had to leave because we wanted to have too many people around here and a lot of people who want to see the beautiful there. We had to leave now to take a bye. Leopard, hopefully, you can see them one day and you'll be able to have a good together. Go fast, eat, that's some. We're going to have to leave about one minute, so we have about a minute left here. So it's just the last minute. We'll stay after the last. Maybe that little lion cub will pop out again. I'm sure she will at some stage. Believe how lucky we are here. Really, a very again. That's why she's all the time. Long cats can sleep for when they want to, when they find a nice, comfortable spot. Curl like to food. As for water, so that absolutely no water in it. This is the best times for animals like leopards or animals. Which means that the That's it. <laughs> Give you that.
energy to all of you. I'm so sorry that our stream went down at that exact moment. Unfortunately, it is just one of those things and something was playing up somewhere and the whole stream dropped. So, while you were gone, while you were away, some of you were catching glimpses of what was happening here with these lionesses. First, a waterbuck appeared on the scene and had a quick look at whatever was happening with these lionesses before disappearing off. There's actually two lionesses there. And then an elephant. All right, I need to just turn this down. And then an elephant bull walked very purposefully down the road. The lioness also rolled over and got up with her cub attached, still attached, and then led the cub into the middle of the road. The cub played around with her a little bit. And then she started digging and basically covered this poor little cub in dust. Luckily for us, the lovely girls at Final Control have actually prepared a clip to show you so that you can see what you might have missed out on. So have a look at this. There you go. A sighting for you. And now look at this. There's an elephant looking a bit upset with life right across in front of the lions. Lions didn't even stir. And behind it comes a vehicle from Mala Mala. And depending on where they position themselves, this is their property obviously, depending on where they position themselves, we will not, might not be able to see Oh, there we go. It's Roy. That's Roy from Arethusa. Roy, do you copy me? Sorry, guys. Just have to be on the Game Drive channel. Uh, can any station copy me on this channel? Okay guys, sorry about this, I just need to chat on the Game Drive channel while I do. Let's head back over to James. Unbelievable afternoon we're having so far. I know that our stream went down and I apologise for that on behalf of whatever alien it was that pilfered apart from the satellite that's sending our signal to you. We've come on to Arethusa. Uh, Brian reckons we're going to find the Anderson Mail on the far western sector. So that is the intention here. Jamie, of course, everyone is going ballistic on the radio at the moment because they can't believe that there's a lioness with cubs on Cheetah Plains. So they're all rushing that way. So just we just give Jamie a bit of time to sort that all out and create a lineup so that there can be some space for her to talk and basically for you to enjoy the sighting unfettered by the administration that must go on on these game reserves because of course it's the joy of seeing leopard cubs like we saw and lion cubs like you've just seen that bring tourists to this area and without them of course we just wouldn't have conservation in on these private reserves uh, we have seen nothing on Arethusa so no that's not true we've seen some impala here on Arethusa but we haven't seen anything else so far. There are plenty of elephant tracks around the place. As you can see, the elephants are breaking all sorts of things all over the place. I'm going to move this out of the road. I don't wish to create another road. Um, Brian, if we need to go back to Jamie, you'll tell me, will you? Yes. There we go. See how strong I am, Brian? so powerful Amen. all five feet and eight inches of me 68 and a half kilograms a <laughs> powerhouse of our times uh, 
All right, Jamie has had to leave the sighting, I think, because there's so many people around there. So, just, I mean, what a joy we've had today to have all those little cubbies, and hopefully we'll be able to watch them grow. Of course, a lion cub, if it's male, one in ten chance of reaching adulthood, and the male leopard about the same. So, yeah, I mean, the odds are not great for them, poor things. But Karula's, like I say, beyond the worst and beyond the great danger. I, of course, am hoping desperately that Sindila is going to come wandering back up here. Now, for those of you who don't know, Sindila is a, well, he's now almost two, I think, isn't he? Yeah. Must be about two years old, just about. And he, unfortunately, had to go to rehab. You know how it goes when, um, you know, children lose their way in life. And he had to go to rehab because he, he bit a dog. And the dog was rabid. He did more than bite it. He dragged it into a tree. Anyway, we were very worried that he was going to be rabid too. So he was sent off to rehab. And he spent six months in rehab. And he's now out of rehab and back on the reserve. They released him. But we haven't seen him yet. He's been down hanging around on the Sand River, where I guess there's more place to hide and probably a little bit more to eat. There is a female Impala, Brian. She's all alone. And what is she doing? That's right. Relieving herself. This is what happens to me. This is what happens every time I stop near any animal, just about everyone they immediately show their complete disdain by voiding their bowels, which of course is a, well, I think it's very really unfair of them. So graceful. Hmm. Right, hopefully she's got some friends through here, or maybe she'll run into the jaws of the Anderson male, and we'll be lucky enough to see it. Oh, elephants, I see some elephants. Over there. <laughs> Sorry, our comms are a little crackly here, everybody. Aaron, you have a comment. Kirsty, can you give it to me again, if you don't mind? <laughs> ah, wonderful. Thank you, Aaron. You say we mustn't be rushed to find anything. You're so happy. We've seen all the cubs. And basically, I guess you're just rather like Brian and I basking in the joy of it all. And I'm sure in the same way that Jamie is right now. now they're just wandering off the road. I'm just going to find out what this road is called so that I can tell the Aratusa guys. I don't know why it's taken me. I know the Cheetah Plains roads for some reason, but despite the fact that I've been driving around here, goodness knows how long, um, I don't know what road I'm on. Central Road is what we're on. That's a very convenient road. Oh, there's another big herd in front of us. Did you hear them going, Boo! Let's go and have a look there. Let's quickly call this in. Station is a breeding herd of elephants mobile south from Central Road, East and West Junction into the block. I won't be staying with them. Oops. Radio is not on. It doesn't really help when the radio is not on. Let's just go and see these others. I'm just going to be quiet. Turn the car off and see if we can't hear anything. Here's some shouting magpie shrikes. There are the others. Elephants, I mean, not magpie shrikes. Now you'll probably find everyone that this is part of the same herd. Or a bull, this is a young bull, possibly tracking the herd. Brian, guess what he's doing? The usual story. Can you believe it? <laughs> that, is, that is unbelievable. It really is spectacular. 
uncanny. <laughs> it is uncanny. <laughs> well, the little cubbies didn't do that, thankfully. Go ahead. Copy, thanks. Let's head across to Jamie. She's got a little elephant in better view than this. I'm not, I'm not sure if I've got a better elephant. I've got a different elephant than James has. In fact, I've got several different elephants. In fact, we have found ourselves right in the middle of a herd on the Mala Mala boundary. And this beautiful elephant cow decided that she really, really wanted whatever was growing underneath all of these dead sticks and twigs. And she wandered past us, gave us that very typical open-eared, head-up look that the females protecting their herd will give before starting to feed. Now guys, obviously we have left the lion cubs. That is because there are other vehicles on their way to that sighting. Isn't it incredible though? Our first view of the Styx cubs, or at least a Styx cub. It is absolutely phenomenal. Today has just been such a lucky day for the cubs of the different big cats. Just wonderful. It's the first lion cub I've seen since the first lion cub I've seen since the last stick cubs that we had before the Birmingham boys very sadly took them out. <coughs> but it is fantastic to see a new era and a new dawn of the various lion prides of this area. Hello boy. And just before we go on to discussing our elephants, Susie, you were saying you thought that that lioness had more than one cub, and please could we confirm that? Yes, as far as I know, between a couple of Styx females, they have six cubs, possibly even more than that, because I think that they might have found two more recently. Oh, big head shake. But Susie, I think we were only seeing one because just one was feeding at that point. There was another female further down the hill, so I don't know if the rest of the cubs were with her or if it were the case that the other cubs were just off by the kill, maybe playing or lying up in the shade somewhere. So I don't know the full dynamics of the Styx females and their various cubs. There is definitely more than one. It was just that we only were only able to see one. Okay, my Ellie bull is moving off. There's a whole herd still coming through at the back there. We'll go forward a bit, see if we can't get another view of them. Looking very impressive in this afternoon sunlight. Making sure that there is an hiding Everybody, I'm driving like a moron because, uh, well, I'm just a bit of a moron really, but uh, the space has opened up at the leopard cubs again. Uh, everybody's gone off to try and see some lions on Torchwood, so we're going to drive back there and see if we can't find them again and spend a bit more time. There is the sun, and as soon as the sun touches the horizon, we're going to be out of there. So we're certainly not going to think about turning a light on, and even before it gets dark, we're going to be pulling out. So I am going to drive quite quickly. We've probably got about, well, Brian, what's the time? Just after four. 20 miles four. We've probably got until five o'clock um, before we'll move out, and we're probably about 10 minutes away well, five at this speed. Uh, so please don't get seasick wherever you are. Uh, lift your drinks off your laps, you otherwise you're likely to spill. And I will drive as smoothly as humanly possible to get back to Karula and her magnificent little babies. 
So we, the only reason we're going to stop for something really spectacular. Now, Maggie, you're in Western Australia, and you say that I taught you the uh, the Shangan word for leopard, which is yingwe, and you want to know what is a leopard cub. Well, you can say it in two ways. You can say a small leopard, which would be yingwe yin tsongo. Tsongo means small. Yingwe yin tsongo, a small leopard. Otherwise, you can say, um, there are another two ways of saying it. You can, you can put what we call, this is getting get very grammatically complex. You can put what they call a diminutive extension. So diminutive, obviously, to make smaller. A diminutive extension on the end of the word ingwe. So it's quite simple once you've got it. Ing, and the diminutive extension is ana. So you can put it on the end of any word. So ingwe plus ana gives you inguana. So inguana would be a little a baby leopard, inguana. Otherwise, you might just say a leopard and it's, it's little ones, it's youngsters, it's, it's babies. And that would be Ntsongwana. So a small with a diminutive. So you'd say, um, if I was to say in Shangan, Kurula and her babies, I'd say, Kurula itsama insinyeni Nantongwana. So Kurula is sitting in a tree with her babies. There you go. <laughs> I hope that makes sense, sort of. I'll do it again if you, if you want me to. And of course, now, Jamie, you've shown you a, leopard, uh, a lion cub today. We've got, we know there are two on Torchwood, and we are very sure that the other Nkahuma Pride lioness, remember, we've only seen the three in the last two sightings we've had of them. We're pretty sure she is in the Malwati, the great valley of the Malwati drainage line, in the middle of Juma, which is fantastic. So with any luck, we'll be having lots of lion cub sightings and leopard cub sightings very soon. Okay, Jamie's back. Let's go get an update from her. I'm going to continue driving hill for leather to get to those cubs. We are back. Now, I've never driven through that particular drainage line. I didn't actually realize what it was going to do to our signal, but clearly that is not a good signal spot. So we've had to turn around because I couldn't go up the other side because <laughs> there was a herd of elephants standing there. So we've turned around and we're going to take a different route towards the open area of Cheetah Plains. We'll take the slightly longer way around while I glance longingly at the lion sighting that unfortunately we just can't check. Okay, well hopefully this road will work out a little bit better. We're on our way after an extraordinary day filled with cubs of all descriptions on our way to check the open area of Cheetah Plains. Now this morning apparently the tracks of Cheetah crossed into the Kruger National Park. That doesn't mean that they didn't decide to come back though. Those, that open area is one of their favorite spots. They might have decided to return. We'll just have to go and investigate. And if we find anything along the way, well, I'm not sure I'll be able to call it in because I have absolutely no idea what this road is called. My map stopped working on my phone and I'm not entirely sure where our, our copy of the map has gone. But we shall continue on undeterred. I know where I am. I just don't exactly know what this road is called. We should actually encounter those elephants along the way as well. They were making their way to the north when we left them. We were talking about the Styx Cubs numbers before we disappeared and you were wondering about just how many we have. And I can promise you that we will double check with the other guides who get to see the sticks females more frequently and 
see if we can't get an exact number of how many each lioness has because there are several sets of cubs and we last when i last saw the six females before they disappeared off to give birth all three of them or all three that i saw were heavily heavily pregnant as we look for our elephants once again <laughs> we have a question as to whether or not i am familiar with the song elephants have wrinkles too the gene in north carolina i'm not familiar i'm unfamiliar with that particular song but now i am very keen to hear it and i'm sure that youtube will be able to provide a version of it once i get back to camp and i'll go and i'll investigate and of course elephants do have the most tremendously wrinkly skin I was very thoroughly amused by the name Mr. Rinky Bottom that was given to that baby elephant. Now, I, I'm still relatively unfamiliar with Rinky Bottom. I'm not sure if I could recognize him if I encountered him. But James actually thinks that he saw him the other day coming right up to the front of the vehicle and doing little play bows and rearing up as Rinky Bottom was famous for doing. Amazing. It's so thick in this particular part of Cheetah Plains. Those elephants could be right close to us and we wouldn't see them. And there's some, just to show you, it's, more, it's much clearer in areas like this than it is anywhere else. Because it's so thick, the animals tend to stick to the easiest possible path. And this is a perfect example of one. This is a really good example of an elephant path. Not just elephants will use it, of course, but it almost looks like a sort of a human-made hiking trail. You can see it curving all the way around there and out towards the road, towards the south of us. And an area like this in particular might not be as clear in more open areas but in an area like this the animals make very and follow very clear paths so just how we say that the predators often walk on roads in order to essentially avoid having to duck and dive obstacles but also to be as quiet as possible in a very very thick areas like this you do get clear game paths This is a place that elephants will regularly frequent. Viam tells me that they were all snacking on the black monkey orange that grows around here. Which always surprises me because it looks like the least appetizing plant that you could possibly imagine. Oh, still can't believe that we got to see that Styx cub. It was such a surprise when she rolled over like that. Did not realize she had a cub with her. Because it looked as though she essentially hadn't moved from where she was found this morning. And perhaps she hadn't. Perhaps the cub just came to find her. to move relatively quickly through here just because it is so dense just to see if we can't get to a more open area where the animals are less hidden away I'm not sure whether this falls under part of Inkanyeni or Tundi's territory or if there's another leopard or leopard female that controls this particular patch or overlap my suspicion would be that it would be more towards Inkanyeni's side than Tundi. They sort of split halfway down through Cheetah Plains. Hey, there we go. Found them again. Our elephants have emerged in a nice open area. Actually, let's 
stop here because there's a calf suckling. Here we go. We might have had to take a slightly circuitous route, but we got there in the end. And since we do seem to be having a show of baby animals, it seems only fitting that we continue with this little elephant calf. The other day I saw an elephant calf that was so young that it was struggling to reach up and to suckle from its mother. Not struggling, but it kind of had to almost sit back on its haunches in order to reach her. That might have been too soft for you to hear, but there was a wonderfully low rumble. Tammy said it has been a fine day of babies and that she is ecstatic. Tammy is watching in Iowa. Tammy, I couldn't agree with you more. We have just been so incredibly spoilt for choice the last two drives on the Sunrise Safari starting with Karula and the anticipation of Styx Cubs and now to be able to follow through with that promise, albeit briefly, able to view them as well for the very first time. And now a herd, a breeding herd of elephant, complete with little calves wandering about. The fork-tailed drongos chirping off in the distance. The silver cluster leaves taking a beating at the moment. And there's, at this point, the elephants are almost entirely, their diet is almost entirely tree-based. Most places around our Traverse area, there is hardly any grass. And what little grass is left is clearly not all that appealing to the elephants. It's brown and dry not very attractive as a prospective meal. And the tree is still holding hints of nutrients and moisture. And particularly they seem to be enjoying the silver cluster leaf, like the one that she got she had in her mouth before she decided if she wanted something better from a baby knobthorn. that incredibly dexterous trunk to work. Oh, maybe that way round will work better. I'm going to stand on it <laughs> in order to make life easier. The wonderful news is that James is back with Karula and her wonderful cubs and since his time with them is limited due to the, the sunlight, let's head back to him. Everybody, you can't believe it. Well, we're back at the leopards, obviously. Look at that wonderful shot there. But it's raining. There's full sunlight on the cubs, but above them, a rather glum cloud has just opened up. Anyway, I think it's a very passing shower. I don't think it's going to south us completely. But I think it'll be fine. There we go, it stopped already. Now we had a wonderful view from the other side just now, but the little cubbies are now facing the sun. So I'm going to move slightly, everyone. I think we'll get a better view closer to where Andrew is. <laughs> Here comes the little one back along the branch. It's just about the time of the day that they'll start to play. Is that okay for you, Brian? Omar, you're in Pennsylvania and somebody has told you a gross untruth. You say, is it true that were you to touch one of the cubs, the mother would kill it because it smelt like human? Uh, Omar, no, that's not true. Absolutely not. I mean, well, you'd be very lucky to get near enough to touch one of the cubs. 
but definitely they would be absolutely fine with their mother if you were to touch one. She'd be very cross with you, not her cubs. You hear the same story about um, birds and birds' nests, that if the nest smells of human being, they won't go anywhere near you, the nest, the mothers, the parents, and it's just not true. I can't believe this weather. It's bizarre. Isn't that wonderful? Little cub yawning. They're just getting active now. Well, <laughs> they were just getting active. And the light is just too spectacular on them, isn't it? I know. You're absolutely right, Michelle, in New Jersey. You say so much cuteness in in such a short time, it's almost overwhelming. It's completely overwhelming. I cannot believe the luck we've had here. Here we go. Now they're playing with mum. <laughs> Lions, leopards, and of course, Jamie had little baby elephants suckling. What else could you want? Now the little one, other little one will hopefully get up and come and join them. Not wanting to miss out. Ooh. I might have to move. Because I think the <laughs> little male is going to wake his sister up. Ooh, he's coming down. Oh my goodness, look at that. <laughs> Kim, you wouldn't know if they'll sleep in a tree for safety. Kim, they might. Um, but it's not that comfortable for them. And so if there's a hyena around, they will almost certainly sleep in the tree for safety. But, uh, yeah, it's more likely they'll hide in the bushes. But they could easily sleep in a tree. I don't think they'll stay in this tree all night, though. They might. I'm interested that she hasn't tried to hoist the kill yet, though. Because of now, of course, we definitely, you know, we're definitely not going to be here after dark. Simply because um, we can't, we, we, hyenas will smell that kill. They'll come into this area, I'm sure, during the course of the night. And I don't know why she hasn't pulled it up into the tree yet. Now, I'm reticent to move everyone while the cubs on the ground without mum. Because they do, they are still a little bit nervous. So let's just wait here, and I'm afraid, let's see what happens. We are so very, very lucky. <laughs> well, Donna, you want to know how the leopards fall out of the trees when they're asleep. Well, there you go, that's how. It's just like you lying on a branch like that and flopping your limbs both sides. And that kind of precludes you falling out. Uh, they can fall asleep very comfortably like that. Well, I don't know. Excuse me. Sorry, Brian. Brian's choking on a fly, everyone. <laughs> there we go. There we go. You're okay. I'm okay. Um, so, Donna, it's, they're not that comfortable in the trees, I don't think. I think that they would prefer to sleep on the ground where they don't have spiky bits of tree sticking into them. But for safety, I mean, they'll lurk up there. But you'll never see them sleep completely soundly. The cubs do. But the mother will always up and look around every minute or so. And then she stops looking. And then she'll put her head down, snooze a bit, and then head up again every so often. I think the other one has gone towards the kill, you know. I'm just going to move again slightly. very important that we don't get between the little one and the kill. Dafam. Let's just wait here. So 
So just two leopards in the tree. And the other one apparently is sort of walking towards the kill, which is basically to the left hand side of your screen. Meh, okay. Mala. Okay. So Andrew's gonna go and have a look at the meat. And I think Karuda will probably go towards there, so we'll leave him to do that, and we'll stay here. I'll just roll the car forward rather than start the engine. Oh, I'm going to have to start it. Strange, bizarre weather. Oh my goodness, we are going to have a sighting here. <laughs> Hello, little Charlotte. <laughs> uh, that is too precious for words, eh? Brian, sometimes all is right with the universe, isn't it? Mum just opening her eyes every so often. Just a sniff on the wind, of course, there is a bit of a wind starting to come up a bit with this slight storm we're having. Now the little one being very fastidious, and unsurprisingly the female cleaning her, cleaning herself there. The male has gone off to have himself a bit of a meal. lucky we've been and to have leopard cubs and lion cubs in one drive is just a treat more rare than I can imagine I think the little one is on the kill everyone the other male but <clears throat> I'm not going to drive there while there's another vehicle there so we'll just let Andrew enjoy that and if we have time before it gets you know before the Sun touches the horizon then we'll go there otherwise we'll just enjoy this lot over here so sweet so it was the male remember that had the 2-2 spot pattern and we reckon that this young female had a butterfly shape on her forehead so let's have a look I'll get my binoculars out and we'll just have a look see on his face at least on her face what her spot pattern is she's three she's gonna be three three I think but there's a triangle of spots yeah, you won't be able to see with this lens on the camera, but there's a triangle of spots on the left, uh, so her right, and then another three on the right-hand side, or her left. So she's going to be 3-3, three, three, and her brother is 2-2. Two, two. And James Richard, I don't know if the colour of the eyes have stopped to stop have stopped changing you say have they stopped changing I'm not sure I don't think they've changed much since I first saw these cubs hers are obviously darker browner than his his are very pale um, they may or may not change a bit more I think you'll probably find they will I mean she is <laughs> she is too sweet I think it's wonderful that he is confident enough to go off towards the kill without his mum and even in the presence of two vehicles. I think that's wonderful. They're obviously a little bit less nervous than I initially thought they were. <laughs> Mother utterly unfazed by life, which is the best. So the, thank you all for your screenshots, apparently they're incredible, 
so thank you very much for that and also just to tell you the atmosphere has changed completely of course there's been a total change in smell from the from the little bit of rain that we've had the petrichor you know my favorite word petrichor there's a, some winter petrichor in the air now a bit of moisture on the wind right andrew's left let's just nip down to the kill there everyone and go and have a look see how are we doing for time there brian Okay, we're going to be here only 15 more minutes, everyone, so I'm just going to sneak down towards where the kill is. A totally different, different atmosphere from when we arrived. It was a very kind of wintry afternoon, well, wintry for us. And now it feels almost like a summer afternoon with a bit of rain. Now I'm going to talk very quietly here. Here's the kill. Well, I'm assuming he's here. I just saw them all taking hundreds of pictures, but maybe it wasn't at him. Oh, there he is. He's there. He's eating. Can you see him, Brian? <laughs> With his little ears. I'm so pleased that he's brave enough to be doing this while we're here. Oh, look. Hello. He is going to have a very, very fat little leopard belly. And she's utterly, utterly unconcerned. I mean the mother. Karula seems to be completely unconcerned. She will be aware, though, you know, if there's a rustling in the bushes that could indicate hyena, well, she'll move. The other thing is, you know, she's put this kill underneath a tree here, and no hyena will be able to get into that tree. So, I mean, even that sort of scraggly jackalberry tree that the kill is under, the cub would be able to leap into should a hyena come across here. We can see that they're very good climbers. I'm going to sneak forward slightly, if we can't get a better view. Oh, let's quickly head across to Jamie. She's got a fascinating bird to show you. I bet it's on cheetah planes. We've got a beautiful view of a fascinating bird. A dark, chanting goshawk. See the bright orange bill and the bright orange legs. One of the larger species of goshawk that we get out here, and we often get to see the little African goshawk and the shikras. It's really nice to see one of their larger cousins bobbing his head about. And if we're really lucky, that's because the sun is starting to go down, it is starting to get darker, it might even give us the call that it gives the chanting goshawks their name. As the name suggests, the chanting is their regular high-pitched, it's not, it's not screechy like a vulture or one of the larger raptors. It's quite a melodious call for a bird of prey. Goshawks, one of the, or well, their name comes from the family that were very often trained as bird hunters by people. So humans, particularly towards the Middle Eastern areas, training up members of the Ocipita family to hunt the various bird species. These, of course, the ones that we see are completely wild, and the only thing that they might form a relationship with out here, apart from each other, is the honey badgers. Not uncommon for goshawks to follow honey, foraging honey badgers around. As I've said that, I'm just double-checking for one. That's, that'd be highly, highly unlikely. You never know, though. A dark chanting goshawk, that wonderful grey colour. And as its name suggests, darker than the pale chanting goshawk. Because ornithologists often have a very imaginative way of naming things. Black-headed oriole, because it's got a black head. 
grey-headed bushwright because it's got a grey head. I suppose you might as well go with the most identifying features of that particular bird. Make sure you can tell the difference between them. We didn't want to take you too long from, no, let's try that whole sentence again. We didn't want to take you away from those cubs for too long. We're still on our way to the open area. So while we head there, back to James and her Karula's wonderful cubs. So we moved round and we came to the other side. He looked at us briefly and then he started to continue to pig out on this impala. He's having a wonderful supper, this young fellow. And so you can see completely weaned now. They are four months old. They may still try a little bit to suckle, but I think they're pretty much weaned by now. So, so special and lucky we are to see this lot. The sun is about to go down, everyone, so, yeah, probably another five minutes here, and then we'll press on. and see what we can find. Creatures of the night. No update on the hyenas at this stage, I'm afraid. Brian and I tried to find them yesterday, failed. We're going to put Herbert onto it tomorrow. He, of course, managed to find these leopards this morning. I think we may have driven past them by mistake eventually, but he managed to track them down here. And quite voracious eating there, isn't it? Yeah. Rachel, you want to know how many kilograms of meat I think he can eat at his age? Well, uh, big, big cats are supposed to be able to eat sort of up to 20% or 25% of their body weight. I doubt he can eat quite that much. Um, I suspect no more than one kilogram. I think he probably weighs about five kilograms. So, yeah, I don't think much more than that. Let's see if the others don't... I was tempted to go back to the tree just to see if we couldn't follow the others down here. But I think we'll do that just before we leave. We'll drive back past them. Let's just enjoy this little fellow having his meal. And he looks pretty confident, you know. He scuffled off when we got here early this afternoon. Brent came and sat with them for a while beforehand. And he, again, he just sat for a long time. And the cub was on the road, this chap. And then he moved off as soon as we arrived and wouldn't come out. And now, after an afternoon of vehicles going in and out, obviously very gently, he's completely comfortable, which is brilliant. Exactly how you want it. We really do want them to behave exactly as they would normally, were we not to be here. That's one of the key things of what we do. And one, one of the things we, you will be interested to know when we go to the TV shows in two weeks' time. One of the things we're going to be discussing at the fireside chat that we have probably is going to be the effect that we do have. Do we have an effect? And we unquestionably have an effect on the environment. You can't drive a car like this around and expect it to be completely without a footprint. So we're going to have a long and interesting discussion, I think, about how it is, what effect is acceptable and what isn't. And there's a, a very sort of grey gray area there. But what's wonderful about this is that the, while we certainly have affected this cub's life, he definitely moves away initially when the vehicles arrive. He's now getting used to us. And that's wonderful. Sarah, you want to know if these cubbies are old enough to know whether to be on the lookout uh, while they're eating for other predators. Sarah, I don't think there's anything nearly as conscious as that. I do know that, that as soon as they're born, they have an instinct to hide. The instinct is to get away from anything that is unfamiliar. And so were they to hear or smell something unfamiliar in the form of a hyena or a lion or something like that, he'd skedaddle up a tree. That would be the fast, fastest thing he did. He wouldn't register why he was doing it, I don't think. I think it would be completely an instinctual action. 
but yes, I think they would react. See, he'd heard something. I think it might be the others coming this way. I can't see them though. Okay, I can see the sun about to touch the horizon. We're going to go and have one more look at the others and then we're going to move on from here, everyone. Wonderful sighting we've had. Very lucky we are. I'm speaking like Yoda. I don't know why. <laughs> a wonderful question here from a Connor in the final control. Connor wants to know, and it's a very good question actually, uh, do the cats have a favorite part of the animal that they like to eat? The answer is absolutely they do, Connor. They will go for the rich, fatty organs to start with in many cases. Cheetah don't. Cheetah go for the hindquarters. But you'll find that the leopards and lions get into the belly first and they'll eat the liver and the kidneys and that sort of thing and the heart very quickly. They'll leave the stomach lining for last, but they will eat that eventually. Uh, but then, then they'll go on to this kind of what we would consider prime cut. Now remember, out here, the most limiting macronutrients, so macronutrients being fats, carbohydrates, proteins, fiber, the most limiting macronutrient in an area like this is fat, because the animals here just don't have fat on them unlike a sort of domestic cow that's been fed on grain and they get that big fat thick layer of, of fat on the meat no African animal out here naturally has that and so the organs are basically where they'll get the fat or unless you're a hyena and if you're a hyena you can chew on the bones and the marrow is quite fatty there none has moved oh we're going to get we are going to get a shot here Is the tree going to be in the way? Is it all right? <gasps> Look at that! Is that right, Brian? <laughs> that is too spectacular. <laughs> oh, wow. Virginia, you want to know how long I think it took them to learn to lie on a tree branch like this without taking a tumble. Virginia, I think it probably took them their first climb up a tree. I don't think it took them any longer than that. They learn very fast. They are instinctually very good climbers. And just like your house cat, they're instinctually very balanced. What a fantastic, fantastic view that is. <laughs> I don't, I'm left breathless by these chaps, I really am.